Okay. Now we're coming to Mark 4 again, and I've already covered this, the part of the text in this chapter that's unique is in uh, verses 24 through 29. But he starts out the chapter in Mark on the left with the familiar sower in the sea. Okay? And let's see, let me change the windows here so you can see more of the Mark text. Sorry, it's hard to do this quickly because of the recording. Okay, let's see if we can do this. Bear with me. It's really hard to get the mouse to stop. Okay. All right. This is the part in Hebrews. He's still on his topic about Nathras being dull of hearing. Okay. He's trying to explain those who have been enlightened. And by parallel, the families, the Pharisees, the, the uh, scribes, they've been enlightened in the sense of they've been around him. They've been enlightened because they had the word of God in their heads, memorized. But they still fall away. Now, the right-hand side, the writer of Hebrews is talking about believers who, who become twice dead. He's talking back to Jude when he does that. The verse in Jude is twice dead, okay? And he's talking back to that because they should have been teachers. Remember he said up here, okay? For by this time you ought to be teachers. That's his theme. You've had enough exposure. You should be as smart as the teachers. But instead, you're just like the Pharisees and the scribes who have enough doc who have enough memorized to be teachers but instead you don't even know the elementary principles okay so you need milk because you can't discern right and wrong even in basic doctrines so he's saying we're gonna we're gonna you know I'm not gonna recover all this basic stuff like you know the repentance from dead works that'll be a theme again in chapter 9 all right I'm not going to talk to you about how bad washing doesn't, you know, it only washes your body. That was what Peter was talking about. The repentance is not the washing of the body. Baptism is not of the body. It's of the soul. Okay? Resurrection of the dead. This was a problem with the Pharisees. And eternal judgment. He's going to cover that when he says that it's been appointed man wants to die. And then the judgment that's going to come up again in Hebrews 9.27. Okay, but right now, he's got to stop and explain, look, there's no fixing you. You're already saved. It's impossible to renew you again to a change of mind because you've already believed in Christ. Okay, the only one who can change their minds is them. There's nothing God can do to renew them. He has to wait for them to change their mind. But they're crucifying the Son of God and putting him to open shame. That's what Christ's enemies are doing on the left-hand side of the screen. So, tracking still to Mark, now chapter 4, the ground that drinks in the rain and brings forth vegetation. Okay, that is whether it's going to bring forth vegetation or thorns and thistles. Vegetation from true belief, true doctrine. Thorns and thistles, false doctrine by false teachers false belief okay the Pharisees are selling false belief the Pharisees are selling false doctrine the scribes are selling false doctrine Christ's own family is saying that Christ is the one who's crazy even though he's being beset by everybody else isn't that weird it's really sad so what does Mark start covering next First of all, he has to go to the sea and teach by the sea so that the crowd, see, this is Mark's constant thing. All the people pounding across the stage, pounding after him. So he has to get in a boat and sit down in order to talk to them. Okay? He's teaching them many things in parables. Yeah, because why? Because they're dull of hearing. See, this is still the parallel because the passage on dull of hearing is going to continue through... Hebrews 
Everybody's dull of hearing. His family, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the crowd. So he has to talk simply to them. He has to give them milk because they're like infants in their understanding. They can't take solid food. And Peter was talking about that. Sincere milk of the word. So see, he's talking to Mark, and he's talking to Jude, and he's talking to Peter. Talking back to those, those books. And at the same time, presenting a comprehensive reorganization of the information. Okay, so, having been enlightened, once you're saved, honey, you can't go back. All right, you're saved. See, partakers. Holy Spirit is indwelling them. They're partakers. They've tasted the word of God. See, the guys on the left, some of them haven't believed in God till yet. They certainly tasted the word of God. They haven't tasted the powers of the age to come, but the audience in the book of Hebrews has. He's setting up a parallel to Mark so that when they're reading the book of Hebrews, they can follow along in Mark and see the parallel to them. I still don't know if Mark precedes well, I guess Mark has to precede Book of Hebrews for this paralleling in the Book of Hebrews to exist. Okay. And then falling away, it's impossible to redo them again to repentance. Now, in the Greek, the, the actual logical order, there's lots of nested clauses here. The actual logical order doesn't read the same as the physical order of the verses that we see translated. Okay, but I can't go into that. My pastor spent a lot of time on that. We're just trying to just show parallels. Ground that drinks in the rain. Tie to the seed parable. Teaching the many things in parables. And so he said, look, the sower went out to sow. God sowing the word in the people. And we just saw who the people were. We got the crowd that's following him everywhere. We got his family trying to assert family over father. We got the scribes and the Pharisees trying to kill him, so they're following him too to see if they can trap him in something. Okay? So the sower, God, and Christ by extension, goes out to sow. As he was sowing the seed of the word, okay, this is playing, uh, James will play to this, receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. See, once you get saved to heaven, now your soul has to be saved by being re re um how do you want to call it refurbished see impossible to renew refurbish with the word see your your body and you're genetically saved to heaven okay but you got the same old thinking in you so now your soul has to be saved that's what james was talking to and that's really what peter was also talking to kind of referring back to james and paul was talking about it a lot Okay, well, that's what the seed parable is about. Some of it falls beside the road. In other words, not in the people. Okay, so they didn't hear it at all. So they're unsaved. The birds came and ate it up instead. Okay? Other seed fell on rocky soil where it didn't have much soil. In other words, there's not much positive volition, but there's a little bit. Okay? It's mostly rocks, meaning they're hard-hearted. Immediately, see, miracle. Immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. Immediately means they got saved. But they're not going to do much with the word after that. They're not going to grow in Christ. Why? Because there's a lot of rocky ground there. First of all, all their negativity is going to have to be cleared. And more soil is going to have to be put in before, they're gonna, before it's going to grow anywhere. This is your typical Christian. They get real rah-rah Jesus in the beginning. Okay, and it might even last for up to five years. And then the minute, you know, they have to get into the depth of the Bible, they fall away. Because really, they're rocky ground and they're really negative to actual Bible study. So they do their rah-rah Jesus songs the rest of their life. And all they remain is little, little tiny plants. They don't grow any further after that. Okay, after the sun had risen, their little seedling was scorched. In other words, when pressure comes on you, all of a sudden you lose your faith. That's the story of most deconverted atheists. Oh, my brother, my brother, my sister, my mother did died. 
and got sick so God was bad and I don't believe you anymore. Or, I prayed to God and he didn't answer me, so I don't believe you anymore. Because you had no root of Bible doctrine in you. And in every single case, every single deconversion case on YouTube, they didn't get the real Bible taught to them. They got the false doctrine put to them. Okay, they got thor thorns and thistles taught to them. Okay, well, honey, after you eat thorns and thistles for a while, you're going to hate it. Yeah, so no wonder they deconverted. I would have deconverted too. If I learned falsely the way they did, I would have the same testimony as every deconverted atheist on YouTube. Because you're getting thorns and thistles instead of food. You're not getting vegetation that's healthy for you. You're getting thorns and thistles. I'm sorry, thorns and thistles don't taste good and they hurt your stomach and they make you sick and they give you diarrhea. Okay, well that creates pressures all by itself, let alone the other pressures of life that scorch you. And because there's no root, because it's just a little seedling at that point, it withered away. He's talking back to Psalm 90 when he says this. Because Psalm 90 is on this very so topic. Very topic. Man just withers away. He's angry at God, so he withers away. Okay? Then we have a different other seed falls among the thorns. See? Thorns and thistles. So see, we're really tracking the mark, aren't we? I mean, this is really getting to be kind of almost uncanny. Just like uh, John 8 is tracking to Psalm 16, which I, I didn't expect. Okay? It's tracking thematically to Psalm 16. So it looks like we're looking at the same rhetorical style. Hebrews is tracking thematically to Mark. Because it keeps on happening. I'm now in chapter 6 of Hebrews. I'm now in chapter 4 of Mark. Now look at that. And I'm just going in, in you know, writing order. Thorns and thistles. Other seed fell among the thorns. And the thorns came up and choked the little seedling. So the little seedling means it didn't mature. When it says yielded no crop. See, vegetation or tree has to mature before it is fruit bearing. When I hear baby Christians say, well, you're not fruit bearing. You're not bearing any fruit. Honey, you have to be mature before you can bear fruit. Your typical tree takes at least 10 years before it becomes a good crop. When you had your first crop of a tree under the Mosaic Law, you had to let that whole crop go. It wasn't until the third crop that you were allowed to eat from it or use it. And that's because the tree needs to go through its thing. All right, well, the third crop of a mature tree, by then it's usually 10 years. Okay, and some trees it's even longer than that. All right, so it didn't mature. It got choked by the cares of this life, as he'll later explain when he explains this parable. But other seeds fell into good soil, real positive volition, really learning and living on Bible. And as they grew up and they increased, they yielded a crop that produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, this is a real sad statement. That means that for every single, that means out of 30 believers, there's only one who's growing to the extent of the other 30. The other 30 don't grow. One out of 60 believers, they don't grow. And remember when I said to you 99% of Christianity? I'm constantly saying 99%. Here's why. One out of a hundred will grow. In other words, in some generations, it's as high as one out of 30. That's a big deal. One out of 30. That's a 3% growth rate. One out of 60. That's a 6% growth rate. Or no, I'm sorry. Um, half that, half of 3%. See, 30, 33%. If it was 33, it would be 1 out of 33. So just say approximately 3% growth rate. 60 is half that. Half the growth rate. 100 fold. 1 out of 100. That's why I say 99% of Christianity. This is Christ's own word about the production. And then Paul echoes that in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. 
And so he kept on saying, he who has an ear, let him hear. Yeah, and what is our boy saying? See? Been made partakers, tasted the good, possible to renew them. Because why? Because they're not hearing. They become what? Dull of hearing. See how he's tracking the mark? Isn't this one remarkable book? I was real skeptical when I first started doing this thing on the book of Hebrews comparing the mark because I didn't see the keywords, but he is tracking. But he's tracking thematically. He's doing, he's basically outlining his own book in the book of Hebrews, which is on, you know, topics that seem to be related but yet remote, very definitely tracking the Peter and the priesthood thingy. And yet the outline that he's following and constructing what he says next. So far through chapter 6 of Hebrews, he's tracking to Mark. Okay? Even to the extent of thorns. Okay? Thorns and thistles right here. We're just talking about false doctrine. Cares of this life. Well, that's a falsehood. Okay, see, look. Thorns and thistles. See, the cares of this life are kind of like little doctrines saying, oh, you ought to pay importance to me, you ought to pay importance to me, and you can fool yourself and tell yourself that the cares of this life are God's will for your life, because really that's what you want it to be. But God's will for your life is to learn and live on Bible. If that's not first in your life, nothing else is going to work. My pastor said that a thousand times, and i got to tell you, for most of my Christian life, I was just like this. Oh, I believe, yeah. Yeah, the sun came up and scorched, had no root, withered away. Cares of this life choked it. I mean, I remember a time when it was people, and that was how you loved God, was by loving people. And God was part of my life somewhere in there. I shudder to think about how little God mattered to me in those early days which was the first 20 years of my spiritual life. So it wasn't just a little part of time. That's my big regret, is that I didn't get into Bible doctrine sooner. And God had to more or less punish me before I woke up and smelled the coffee, which is a pretty typical story. Thorns and thistles of this life choke you. So that you mean to study Bible, you say you care about God, you really mean it, you're not lying. Yeah, and then Johnny needs a haircut, and you got to do the dry cleaning, and there's this TV program on that's about politics that's important, and your best friend is on the phone. Yeah, and all that time you're going to spend on Bible is suddenly choked from your life. This is typical Christianity right here. And then at the end, all you've got is thorns and thistles of this life to show for it. So, of course, when the sun rises and scorches you, you don't have a wellspring of doctrine in your soul to rely on and carry you through the hassles of life. And they come to everybody. You don't have that root, being rooted and grounded in love. Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. And also Ephesians 1, 15 on forward. Being rooted and grounded in love. Love is a metaphor for Bible doctrine that Paul used in Corinthians already. 1 Corinthians 13 means Bible doctrine, not love the emotion. But see, if you're all choked, you're going to think it means human emotion. Okay, and then when your human emotions get scorched by the conditions of life, you don't have the root of Bible doctrine in you to nourish you. And so you're going to lose your faith. This is the, this is the biography of Christianity right here, not maturing. That's why the rapture hasn't happened until yet. Okay? Cursed, close to being burned. Okay? One out of a hundred Christians. And sometimes it's as high as 3%. Whoa! As high as 3% of Christians might be maturing. But more normally, it's one and a half. And in times like now, 1%. Pretty sad, huh? But yet everybody who has ears can hear. Okay, now we'll get to the interpretation of the parable in the next segment because I'm afraid my machine is going to die. But notice how Hebrews is really tracking this order. Okay, we're now in another increment following a, a very comprehensive 
style that I've only seen once before um, in John 8 where the order of presentation of the information in John 8 is actually the outline is the, he is tracking the outline and the order of Psalm 16 I've already done videos on that I didn't realize that the same kind of thing can be done on such a wide scale because the book of Hebrews is about why the change in covenant what's the new priesthood what's the New Testament that's the whole purpose of the book it's elaborating on what Paul wrote in Galatians Colossians and especially Ephesians okay Paul didn't talk so much about the priesthood my pastor had his own idea about why but Peter did and we've already seen how Hebrews is definitely playing on what Peter talked about the priesthood in both first and second Peter Jude wrote directly quoting verbatim passages in second Peter and wove in extra stuff that he got directly from God about Satan arguing over the body of Moses and a direct quote of Enoch with the there's no book of Enoch he was quoting Enoch directly and then the book of Hebrews obviously is talking about angels starting right off the bat which Peter talked about but you talked about more so we saw those ties what I didn't expect because this is what I don't know the 20th video I've been doing on this parallel now I didn't expect to find that the book of Hebrews was going to track to the actual verse and topic order that Mark is using in his gospel Mark's gospel is basically this hi there's everybody running after Christ nobody's listening to what he's saying they're just running after him the crowd is running after him because they want him to do miracles the Pharisees are running after him because they wanna they wanna they wanna they wanna they wanna so badly trap him in something okay the scribes are running because they want to trap him in something and Christ's own family is running after him John 6 will elaborate Christ's own family is running after him because they want family to be more important than father. Now, I did it in that tone because that's the tone that Mark is using. Mark is very rushed because Mark's other tone is, oh, you're getting all these miracles, you're getting all these miracles here at 68 AD and you're just as dull of hearing. Sluggish in this verse. Dull of hearing was in 511 of Hebrews. You're just as dull of hearing with all these miracles in front of you as the Pharisees were when they when Christ was there. You're just as dull of, dull of hearing and sluggish about listening to the real message here as Christ's own family was when he was here and they lived with him every day. That's why they became dull of hearing. All these miracles and healings that he does for so many people, they follow after him. Why? not to hear what he says they want to marry the rich man for his money they want the miracles baby they don't give a flip about what the Word of God says so mark is juxtaposing these themes and not talking very much about the doctrines because the people aren't listening to the doctrines they're all agog over the healings trying to discredit him because he's doing that or trying to get something get his healing from it so what are they sluggish dull of hearing and that was where the bookend this is the second bookend this word is actually Greek word nothros and it means a dull knife it comes to mean a dullard you can't cut anything you know you're not incisive you can't understand you're slow you're dim and it's not dim because your brain has got a problem. It's dim because your will has got a problem. You don't care. Yeah, you care about the miracles, and you'll follow Christ anywhere if you get one of those miracles. I mean, what is what are most of the Christian programs on? Oh, miracle healing, rah rah Jesus, make you feel good, and doctrine presentation, actually learning Bible, almost nothing. the same story today so as soon as he was alone yeah I got to get away from these people let me get rid of see 
That's the parable. And even the apostles didn't get it. They asked him questions. Okay? Yeah, we're going to give you a mystery in Greek. It means a, a set of doctrines known only to the group. In other words, if you belong to Phi Kappa Sigma, that's a sorority, I think. I forget. There's somebody's, you know, sorority or fraternity. And you belong to Phi Kappa Sigma, and they have little special ceremonies and little special doctrines about sisterhood or brotherhood that only the people within that fraternity or sorority know. That's what mystery, mysterion, means in Greek. Doctrine known only to the insiders of the group. It's a mystery to everybody else. Okay? So when it says to you have been given the mystery, in English that sounds contradictory. So you have to say secret doctrines here. They're not really secret now. But at the time, we're giving you the actual lowdown. Everybody else is getting, you know, like symbolic meaning. Because, and this is why I had this thing, okay? Because seeing they won't see, hearing they won't hear. This is quoted by Isaiah many times. Let me show you the English. See? Keep on listening, but don't perceive. He's being really sarcastic here. It means seeing don't see, hearing don't hear. Okay? Looking don't hear, seeing don't see, hearing don't hear. It's hearing is listed first. Now, what does that literal phrase mean? It means that you're listening and listening and listening and it's going in one ear and out the other. In other words, God is not forcing them not to get it. The Calvinists will say, well, God closed their eyes. God closed their ears. No, they're closing their own ears. They're acting just like Pharaoh. You listen and listen and listen and it goes in one ear and out the other. You see and see and see and it never registers. They saw all those miracles. See, that's why Mark is listing this. Okay? You saw all those miracles. And yet you don't understand. And that he's he's playing back to what will later become Isaiah 53:14. Okay? They see and didn't understand. The Gentiles will see what the Jews did, saw and didn't understand. The Gentiles will understand what the Jews saw, but the Gentiles didn't see it. I've, I've covered that already in my Isaiah 53 playlist. So you can go look at the last videos in that list where I have the full translation, in meter translation of Isaiah 53. I show the Hebrew and the translation. I, I changed it. I, ch I did my own meter translation so you could see the cadence. It's really sad. Keep listening, but oh, don't learn anything. Now he's talking also to what Paul said in First Timothy, First Second Timothy two twenty six. It might be First Timothy two twenty six through three seven. This is plain to that also. <coughs> Dull of hearing, see, way up here. Because this is a digression from 511. It's very sarcastic. Sanctified sarcasm, my pastor called this. Dull of hearing. Greek word is nothros means that you can't cut anything with a dull knife. You're not incisive. You're not listening. You don't have the sharpness of the word of God in you. Okay? Thorns and thistles. And then he's being really sarcastic here. Oh, but beloved, we're convinced of better things concerning you and the things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For, oh, God is not so unjust to forget your work and the love you have shown toward his name. See, this is what they're thinking of themselves. How good they are. God's not going to forget how hard we worked. Yeah, and... But we desire that each of you show the same diligence to, let's translate here, full assurance. This is talking about the doctrine, believing in the doctrine. You'll be revisiting this whole phrase 
in Hebrews 11, 1, which is mistranslated, until the end, until completion, until the end of the temple in particular, which he'll explain in Hebrews at the end of Hebrews 10. So that you will no longer, this should be no longer be, sluggish, not thrust again, same in Hebrews 5, 11, but instead imitators of those who, through the doctrine and patience, will inherit the promises. In other words, honey, oh yeah, you're so proud of your works here. Okay, well, there's a different work you need. There's a different, see, diligence should be translated eagerness. That's spudazzo again. Okay, spudas. To realize the full assurance, this is, this is a, kind of a, it's not exactly a mistranslation, but it's sort of sanctified sarcasm. For getting the full doctrine in your head until the end of your life, until the end of the temple, until the end of the destruction that's forecast when he gets to the end of Hebrews 10. So that by then you will not be, you will no longer be dull of hearing, nathros, sluggish, but instead imitators of the guys who are maturing. And they're going to inherit the promises, but maybe you won't, because you're so busy thinking about your works. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so how does that relate to the left-hand side of the screen? Oh, very easily. Hearing they don't hear, seeing they don't see. Okay, again, we come down here. Isaiah says this more than once, but we'll just use this passage as an example, and I'll keep it frozen. See, hearing they don't hear, seeing they don't see. Otherwise, oh, they might turn and be forgiven. In other words, they're hearing, 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 and priding themselves on their hearing. That's like the Jews standing in front of the wailing wall. They memorize the Torah. They say it all day long. But they're not learning what the words mean. Christians are the same way. Chanting, chanting, chanting. Learning nothing. Keep on listening. Keep on talking, but don't perceive. Keep on looking, looking, looking at the Word of God, but don't ever understand it. Make songs about it instead. Read your little verse for the day instead. Oh, I read the whole Bible. Uh -huh. Did you understand any of it? Oh, no. Their ears are dull. Look at this. Now we know how our boy got the word dull. He's king off Mark. Mark doesn't quote that particular word yet. But Isaiah 6, 9 is talking to what Mark did quote. And the writer of Hebrews knows what's next in Isaiah 6, 9. So he's tracking to Mark by using what's next in Isaiah 6, 9, which on the left-hand side of the screen is quoted in blue. Is that cute or what? And he started that quotation way up here. Doll of hearing. See what you're missing if you don't know, if you don't pay attention to how the Bible books are organized? Isn't this awesome? I've never seen such genius in my life. I, every time I pick up the Bible, I think it can't get more genius than this. Okay, but it did. I'm totally blown away by this. If you can come up and prove that it's wrong, I'd love to hear it because I'm I'm almost afraid. Okay, you know when it talked about that word, um, eulabea, you know, circumspect, and then it translates into godly fear, you know, awe. That's how I feel right now, and I'm going to start crying, so I'm just going to sign off. Because this scares me. It's so gorgeous and so perfect. I feel I shouldn't be allowed to know it. So I'm hanging up. Peace out.